ladies. God bless you guys. My name is Betty. Um, I did a sharing teaching a few weeks ago. And tonight is so important for me. Um, before I get into the word, I just want to explain to you guys my testimony about the, about me finding out the holiness of God. But before I get into that, I just want to explain and humble myself to whoever is on this line and humble myself before the Lord that me, I am not worthy one bit to speak of his holy name and to explain who he is. I am a sinner in need of him. I am not a smart person, and I don't know everything. I need his help in every way I can. And I just want to explain that to you. But a year ago, from the, like a year ago, I heard a sermon, girls, and I read through the scriptures, and I've never been the same. I can't explain to you how it opened my eyes and it revived me. I was a new person because I found out truly what holiness is. And I had a different view and a different outcome in life. And this is why it's so important that I chose to talk about this, is because knowing him, knowing his true holiness, gives us an opportunity to know who he is and what is our state by knowing this true holy God. So I want you to understand this too, and I want to share these scriptures with you. So let's, let's get into it. Let's not delay anything. So if you guys got your Bibles, I, I would ask that you go with me through the scriptures. And if you don't, you guys could take little notes. So let's go into the first scripture. It's in Isaiah 40, 25. It says, To whom then will you compare me that I shall be like him, says the Holy One. Over here we see God is asking a question. Is there anyone like me? Can you equal up someone to be like me, says the Holy One. So he does describe himself as holy. And you also see this in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 17. O Lord, is there anyone like you? There is no one besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. But what does this word mean, holy? I know we all grew up seeing and hearing it in churches and from our families. And I always thought it meant good or something acting perfect but as I kept reading through the word I found that to be false and I just want to say girls but for me to sit here and tell you today if I could fully explain or if anybody else in this world could try to explain it perfectly we would be lying to you terribly because even the right words that we seem to find is not going to explain his holiness because words cannot fully describe who he is and the only one who fully understands God and knows him and has seen him is Jesus Christ himself. We can only get what our minds can understand, and that is what he gives us to understand. But our minds are finite. And what does this word mean, finite? That is that, it means that we have limits to our understanding, girls. I looked up the word um, attention span, and it means that we only have like 20 minutes, girls, to focus on some kind of topic. So our minds could only go 20 minutes to focus on one thing. We would have to renew it, our minds, to rethink what it is and to set our minds on it. But unlike God, His holiness is infinite, which means He has no limits, and there's no way to measure it. It is beyond our comprehension, girls. Our minds will never fully grasp it, so we will never really explain it correctly. But what we can do is share what we get from his holy word. It can give us somewhat of an understanding as we grow to know him more and more. The holy word, the mean holy word in Greek means hagios. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's called hagios. And in the Hebrew it's called kadash, which means set apart and sacred. In other words, girls, it means different and opposite, opposite of common and in unique. <laughs> so you see, God is not like that. He is actually warning people, and you could find this in Psalms 50, 21, saying that you thought that I was like you. So he's not like man or anything else. He is separate from everything that's created. He will always be holy, and we will never, he will never cease to be holy, girls. If he was to even try to be 
cease to be holy for a second, he wouldn't be who he said he was perfect and holy because God's holiness is actually his being. It's not something he decides to be and then at one moment he decides not to be. It is who he is. And I think the holiness is the foundation of his being, girls. And every other attribute of his that we're going to be speaking about is an expression. It's an expression of his holiness. Amen? So it's not something he decides to be. It is the foundation. So God doesn't have these different parts of him. It's not like I'm saying he has different parts of him, like uh, of his attributes at different times, because God is always the same, and all his attributes works perfectly together. But unlike us, at one moment we could be happy, and in the next minute we could be sad. But he is always the same and perfect in all his ways. But nowhere do you girls find in the Bible someone explaining him to be to the third degree as love, 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 or truth, truth, truth. But I know in Revelation 4, as the angels cried, they said, holy, holy, holy. So his holiness defines his holy truth, and his holiness defines his holy love. They're separate, and they're not like ours, because our love and our truth has flaws and limits. At one point, we will cease to love Let's say if someone gets us angry, even though we love them, our love is not the same because we have selfish ambitions. And this is common because anything other than him is imperfect. But he is perfect in all of his ways, and there is no one to compare to him. And unlike us, we learn from others, and we can actually say we compare ourselves to others, like our families, our parents, even pastors, leaders. But he compares himself to no one. And this is why he says, I am who I am. Because if you were to ask me today, Betty, who are you? I would tell you I'm Jeff's wife or I'm Sam's daughter. But he is and there is no one before him. Amen? Now the word transcendent, because he is transcendent. What does this mean? It means to go beyond and to exceed. God is above all of his creation. A wise man named A.W. Tozer once said, the same way that God is above a caterpillar, he is also above an archangel because both are created beings that created, that they are, they are created. Unlike him, he was not created, girls. He is holy, so he is not to be low, level, lowered. Or in other words, he can't be lowered by men. God is higher than men and higher than men's standards and man's ways. And you could see this in Isaiah 55, 8. He says, For my thoughts are not like your thoughts, nor are my ways, says the Lord. Amen? So you see, man has a way of being girls. What they know, we all have this pattern of life, and we depend on things and people. And we don't understand things that are outside from us, because we know not of them. And this is also common. And you see this in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you guys got your books, go to Ecclesiastes 1, 9. It says, what has been done, it will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. You see, we are all common. We all rely on air. And the most strongest person needs air girls. And what man, one man does, another will also do in this world. It's just a redo. Someone will have, maybe have a little bit, and someone will maybe have plenty. But no one has done what another will do. It is like chasing the wind. But God is holy, and he relies on no one. And he does what no one can ever do, because he is above all men in all his ways. Let's look at the start of the verse, Isaiah 40, verse 26. He says, lift up your eyes on high and see who created all these things. This is transcendent. There is no one like him, because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author of all things. And there is none in his level or close to it. Psalms 92, verse 8 says, But you, O Lord, are high and forever. Amen? So I want to go here and look to what King David was saying in Psalms 83. When I looked at the heavens and the works of your fingers and the moon and the stars, which you have set in its place. So David was gazing into the night sky and was amazed at all the creation in the galaxies that God had created. 
And he, being a watcher of sheep at this time, must have thought to himself every night, being amazed by God's works. So I wanted us to consider God's works a little too. And I wanted to see what men have been trying to understand of it. So we're going to go into history a little bit, girls. 1961, almost 2,000 years later, you see that man explored space. He went out of space for only about 108 minutes. This is 2,000 years later. And in July of 1966, they claimed that a man went to the moon and walked on it. And in 1970, Apollo 13 was recorded to reach the farthest distance to reach in the cold depths of space. They went the farthest that any man could have gone out of space. But they do have a plan, supposedly in the year 2030, that they're trying to reach Mars, which is about 40, 54 million kilometers away. That could take up to 300 days for a man to reach. But man hasn't made much progress since then. But now, back in history, 1977, they created girls these probes. They're like machineries to search out the universe and the planets. And they put this record and recordings in it. It's got the earth sounds, the winds, the waters. They even left a message to see if there's any existence out there. These probes are called Voyagers 1 and Voyagers 2. And they outreach men in anything that man has placed in the universe. They went the farthest. They went about 13.2 billion miles away from the Earth. And this took them 41 years to, to do. And they say out of 100% outer space, they only know 4% of it. That's 96% of unknown space to men. And they call this the dark energy and dark matter because it's, it is dark to them. They say that the dark energy is more unpredictable than the dark matter because they see and they hear nothing. But somehow they say that the dark energy spaces are expanding. They're growing. But all of this figuration they have is a theory. So all of these scientists and all these astronauts and all of these smart regimes for years can't even explain what's going on up there in these galaxies. What's happening? They don't know. Why? Because this is a work of something different in his ways, in the knowledge of building this galaxy, on which men can never understand how its existing is. They can't ex understand how this galaxy is ex exists and how it works. This takes us back to Isaiah 55, 8, how his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. What a God, girls. If you could go with me to Job 26, 7, it says, He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He is the one who designed the galaxies, even the voids, empty spaces which man can never reach or understand. And Hebrews 11.3 uh, 11, says that by faith we believe God created the universe by a word, girls. By just the word he created this whole universe which man can not ever understand. So this holy God created the universe with just the word. It's amazing. Quote me now to Psalms 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handwork. What men searched out and failed to understand and failed to do is because it is for God's glory and to show who he is, and he is mighty because he is glorious in his wisdom and how great his knowledge is. Our God is holy. He is the holy one. Who can be compared to his mind? No one. Amen? Go with me now to Exodus 15, verse 11. Moses was singing to the Lord after he helped them from the land of the Egyptians. Who is like you, Moses said. Who is like you among the God? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? God shows us through his ways and being that he is the only true God. People used to have false gods, girls. They would worship things that cannot do anything as our God does. They are nothing. He is the only true amazing God. Go with me to 1 Samuel 5 verse 2. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon. 
Dagon, I'm sorry. And they set it up beside Dagon. So what is the story behind this? Well, we read that the Israelites disobeyed God by listening, by not listening to him, as Leviticus 26.14 says. But if you will not do all that these commandments, not listen to me, says God. Now we go to verse 17. It says, I will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you. So God is chastising his people here by letting them get defeated by these Philistines. But these Philistines took the ark of God, which had the holy commandments in, and where the presence of God would come upon. So they took it as if they defeated God through the help of their false god, Dagon, the fish god. Go to the next verse. And when they arose the next day before Dagon, uh, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon out, put him back into his place. So these people woke up after celebrating that night over the victory and defeat over the Israelites. Then walking to the house of Dagon, they seen the God flat on the, on the floor face towards the Holy Ark. And I just wanted to say that in multiple places in the Bible, when people experience God's work and his presence and power, they fall on their faces in amazement and fear. God places Dagon and his false god in the same position as if something that acknowledged him as the one true God. Did not the Philistines that also worshipped their false gods face down realize this? Go to the next verse. And when they rose in the next morning, behold, Dagon fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both hands were lying cut off at the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Not only was he in a position of humbleness of fear, but now he was destroyed. God was showing the Philistines, just because I let you defeat the Israelites for my glory, you did not defeat me. And he showed them that they were, their fake God kneels to him, and also how he could destroy it. But he did, he did destroy it, and he put his head in his hands by the doorpost. These people must have stepped over to God, their God's head. For me, that just proves, look, you step over your God's head because the head was at the threshold, the doorstep, the doorpost. So they must have stepped over their God's head and they, they fix their God back into its place. Now, unlike our true God, who is holy, no one can defeat him. No one is above him. What he says goes. So the Philistines end up sending back the Ark of the Covenant out of fear because God has placed many sicknesses on them. This just shows that so people don't worship idols today, girls, as back in, back in these times. But they do make false idols out of anything they worship. In Matthew 6, 21, it says, For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Whatever is treasure to someone, they set their hearts to in their life. But he should be our treasure, as David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I would not sin against you. David knew how holy God was, God's word was, and sacred. So he held them as if they was more than treasures just as they are more than the treasures. It says this in the book of Proverbs. So whatever is a God to, to people other than the true God, it will be destroyed. Because God, God is a jealous God, and God is a just God. He deserves all glory. All glory in Him alone. No one is to be share His glory. He is holy alone. No one is like our Yahweh. He is in charge of everything. And one day, girls, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord whether they like it or not. Go, to, go with me to Luke 19.40. He answers, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones will cry out. Jesus was telling the Pharisees they wanted the people to stop praising him, to stop praising Jesus. But Jesus said that even if they did stop, the rocks will praise his holy name. And in Exodus 19, we see how God uses the nature when he spoke with a thunder, and how the mountain trembled when God ascended on it. In the form of a fire, he ascended on it. There was smoke everywhere, causing darkness, and these mountains shook. Even the, even the nature acknowledges his holiness, girls. Go to me, Luke 8:28. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said out loud, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg of you, do not torment me. So over here we see legions of demons pleading, saying, acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. 
they obeyed him, and when he gave them per permission to enter the pigs, they were fearful of him, knowing his capability that he has over them. So I want you to look at the God we serve. The galaxies confess his glory. The false gods bow down to him and are destroyed. And all the earth, all the earth worship God. And even the demons fear and tremble because he is the creator of all. He is the Lord of the Most High. As Isaiah 57, 15 says that his name is holy. Amen. And we know that one of God's holy commandments was not to take his name in vain. We as parents want respect from our kids, from our nieces, our nephews, not to call us by name. And we ourselves don't call our older people by their names. So why is it so easy for us to use God's name in vain? And more or worse, we made it like a slang or a phrase to tell somebody that things are nice. Like, God bless your shoes. Should we use the Most High God's name to celebrate someone getting a shoe? We should only praise his name and use his name as it comes out of our mouths to praise him. For he is the majestic king of kings. Amen? He is a holy and eternal king, not like any king we know. I want you to go to Daniel 4.30. This is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking. And the king answered, this is the, the king, I can't say his name right, but his name is Nebuchadnezzar. This is him talking. Uh, he says, look at the great Babylon, which I have built, my mighty power as royal residence, and for the glory of my majesty. That's him talking. So the king, a year before this thing, before he said this, was a year before, he was warned through dreams because he was a prideful king that he was going to be cut off. Daniel interpreted this dream to him, and he still went on. So as he just ended to say this, a voice from heaven spoke to him, saying, Now his kingdom has departed from him. But worse, he would be amongst animals. He was going to be amongst animals to live and to be as one of them. He actually grew girls' hair as long as the eagle, eagle's feathers, and his nails grew like birds. He was even eating as an animal. This is what God did to him because he was so prideful. He ate and he, and he humbled himself until he humbled himself and realized that God is the most high who rules over all. He was going to be like this until he humbled himself, girls. For his glory. He stayed at the, so he stayed at the animals. But if you look in verse 34, it says, At the end of the day, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to the heavens. He lifted his eyes up to the heavens. And my reason turned to me. Himself came to himself. And I blessed the most high and praised and honor because he lives forever. So girls, God humbles the proud because he's higher. But if you look, uh, men are higher than animals. God made this man, Nebuchadnezzar, lower, lower than the animals because of his, his prideness. Because he alone is king and he's high and there's none like him. So let's go and read Isaiah 6, 1, girls. But before we read this, let's talk about King Uzziah. He was the king at this time. And we know he made his army strong, and he cared for the soil of the land. He became a model to his people, a great king. But as time passed, he became prideful, too. All the good that he had done for the people. He became prideful because after all the good that he done for the people. So one day he went to the temple to burn incense to himself. But God, but God didn't like that because only the tribe of Aaron could have done this. So as the priest tried to stop him, the king was very mad that the priest, uh, that the priest was so bold, not wanting him to do this. At, the, at that moment, God sent leprosy upon this king, and he knew that it was God's judgment on him. So he was isolated from everyone. Even though he was king, he was isolated from everyone. And he had to leave his own home because of the leprosy. Back then, leprosy was a huge thing. Um, it, it was like it was blackballed. So again, before we go in to read this, I just wanted to say that I know every Bible reader, girls, when speaking of the holiness of God, Isaiah 6 is the most used. I know this chapter changed my life on my way of thinking. So I ask everyone not to just hear what I'm about to say, but to meditate on it. And also, once we're done, to go and read Isaiah 6. 
So let's read Isaiah 6, 1. The year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his trail of his robe filled the temple. So when we look here, it says that this is the year that we just now talked about, that king with the leprosy, he died. He was a great king. People crowned on him. He was king for 52 years, and these people counted on him, and it was a time of total despair over his dead. The people was like left in void. But Isaiah, as he looked up, he had a vision. He sees now a king that is high and lifted up, a king that is eternal and reigns forever, that no king or ruler can ever compare to him. His king will stand, and his majesty will never be put to shame, like this king's leprosy. And his royalty and his beauty will never fade away. He is not like any man or king. Amen? When I mention his role in filling the temple, it just amazes me. Just as you see today, girls, throughout history, kings and queens, they have this robe. Uh, they have this robe, and it, it resembles royalty. Well, God's robe, girls, filled the temple, which must have been a very large temple. If he is an infinite king, how huge would this temple be? Because it's a, the it's a temple of an infinite king. So there's never been such garment as of this before. It is a symbol of how there is none like him. No, not one. Let's go to the next verse. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two covered his face. We got to we got to really imagine this, girls. Really, as I'm saying it, I want you to imagine it. Above him stood seraphims. These are angels, and they had six wings. Two to cover their faces, and two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. So far we know that these angels, there's not much mentioned them in the Bible. All we know is that they're in the presence of God, and that the figure of them was given for a reason. Two, two wings was given to them to cover their face and their eyes. Even the angels, girls, can't endure God's brightness, and they are dazzled by it. In the same way that we try to gaze upon the radiance of the sun, and if the angels are overwhelmed by the majesty of God, how great will it be for the carelessness of men if they dare to approach him? He is pure. His image is frightening, not as a monster, but as something that's not like us, greater, holy. You will see this with Paul on the road to Damascus when he was blind and looking up towards Christ. Or in Exodus 3430, how the people of Israel and Aaron was frightening over the radiance which was shown through Moses by him being in the presence of God. So how much more is it to be the exact presence? These angels out of shame covered their faces because God is above all. He's above men and above all his creations, including them. Just as he was ashamed of being like underdressed in a wedding, you would want to hide yourself, right? In shame. How much more should a creature feel in the presence of a perfect, almighty, everlasting, all-knowing, glorious God? Amen? So in the two other uh, wings, they covered their feet. What I could get out of this is because the place that they're in is holy, and them that are created, beings, are shameful to expose their feet, so they hide them against the Holy One. Verse 3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The, the earth is filled with his glory. So as these creatures are in the presence of God, they don't cease to stop glorifying God, girls. With those exhaustions of them glorifying God, God supplies them to go on. While we fell short of the glory of God, these angels go on and on and on. And what are the words that these angels are using to glorify God? The only thing that they could express out of their mouths to one another is holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There is no other words to describe his glorious power, perfect righteousness. He is holy, like not like any other. He is without error. How amazing are these angels? Go to the, they go to the third degree to explain his holiness. Just as there is three persons in the Godhead, the Holy Father, the Holy Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So shall the angels continue to describe the Holy God three times. Amen. First Samuel 2.2 2. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. The earth is filled with his glory. Everything from the sky to the trees, the oceans, the winds, and all God's creation that shows his work, and he is sovereign. Even the stars, the Bible says, know them. He knows them by name. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of hosts. So you could find this at Isaiah 37. But the king of the Syrians told the people of Jerusalem, after Hezekiah said to them, Do not be afraid of the army of the Assyrians, but God will defeat them, said Hezekiah. But the king of the great army told him, We have defeated many people and their gods. Don't listen to Hezekiah. So God sent his angel, and in the second girls he killed 185,000 of the Assyrian armies. Could you picture this? 185 dead bodies was everywhere. So I want you to go to Matthew 10.28. Also, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So God is the sovereign holy Lord, the host. He is to be feared of reverence. No army can defeat him. Amen. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. God's fierce anger towards sin. His fierce anger towards sin. You, you can see this in Exodus 19:18, In Revelation 15, 7-8. The mountain shook. And the glory in his anger smoked in his presence. Verse 5. And I said, Woe to me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I want to stop here and really look what Isaiah is saying here. What am I? He says, lost. Other translations say, doomed. At this moment, the prophet now relates how powerfully he has been affected by this vision that he has fallen. Is it is, is if as he lost his mind, girls, that he was so terrified by seeing God that he expected immediate destruction upon himself. He says the reason for believing that is all over for him. He's done. Because he says, I am a man of unclean lips. Why? Because he has seen the holy, perfect God that hates sin. He cannot tolerate it. He is too pure to even look at the smallest sin. It is disgusting to him. You can see this in 2 Samuel 6, verse 7 and 8, when a man named Uzzah tries to stop the Ark of the Covenant so it will not fall. God ends up striking him dead. You might say, well, that's a little too extreme for God to do such a thing. But it's recorded in Numbers uh, 4, verse 15, that a high priest was only allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. So God, when he gives commandments and they're not done, they are being, whoever does this is being charged from an infinite holy God. And you see, it would have been better off if the Ark would have fell to the ground. It would have been better off for the Ark to fell to the ground. Because only God commands. And I want to look at another thing. Man, man is tainted in sin. So God's holy ark, but not to say that Uzzah would have defiled God's ark, because God's holiness cannot be defiled. It is more powerful than men. And its holiness will not get defected. Rather, it affects something or someone. You see this when the woman was healed, that when she touched the harm, hem of his, Jesus' garment, she was healed. There is either going to be effect from God's holiness, whether there will be from grace for a healing, or whether wrath for destruction, and Uzzah was affected by God's judgment. 
You also see this done with Aaron's two sons, when they did not listen to God's commands on how to offer to the Lord. They did not do what he directed them to do. They offered him unauthorized fire, and fire came out before the Lord and consumed the two. You could see this in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. And if you read to the next verse, Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord said among those who are near me. I will be sanctified holy, and before all the people I will be glorified. God is telling Aaron, I am to be holy, set apart for men. I am to be glorified through my justice. If something I say doesn't go, I will, I will use my justice and I will be glorified. We also see this with Lot's wife. God told him not to look back towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And she did, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Also the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, was killed for not listening and lying by hiding their own money. And most of all, girls, Adam and Eve, they did not listen to God eating a fruit from a tree. They said not to because of them. Disobedience to the Holy God, death came to all men and all the earth. So one sin caused disease to the whole world and death. Now look at us who do hundreds of sin in a week. This is why Isaiah said, girls, woe is me. Because he is a holy God and he does not let sin get away with without being punished. He is a good loving God that hates bad and his wrath is upon all unrighteousness because he alone is righteous. Well, you might say, Betty, so that's the God of the Old Testament. Well, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? So then, Betty, we're all doomed then. Well, let's read on. Out of the seraphim flew, one, one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues, and from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has taken away your sin. Now your sin is atoned for. So this was all a picture to what was to come, girls, to atone the sins of all believers. And we find this in Isaiah 53. Verse, we're going to start at verse 4, and I'm going to read it all. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet he considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our infinities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We was all like sheep that have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the equinity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before it is shares, and silent. He did not open his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away, yet for his generation protested, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was punished. He was assigned grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his debt, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life offering for sin. He will see his offerings prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be sanctified. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their inquiries. Amen. You see, girls, God is holy, perfect, and just, pure and righteous, and in him there is no darkness. He is truth and light. Our God hates wrongdoing. His wrath is upon all who are against his holy commands. In him being just, he cannot go against himself. He can't. He has to do what is right and judge those who do wrong. The Bible says that none is righteous. No, not one. All of us deserve the wrath of God. But God is also a merciful God, and he is love, and he is gracious. And in his holy wisdom, he sent his holy son to take the place of us sinners as a propitiation 
What we can be righteous. Jesus bared our sins. He became a servant, doing the will of the Father, living a perfect, holy life. He traded with us girls, as Second Corinthians 5.21 says. He who knew no sin became sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. He made a way, and he is the only way, and through him, all who believe and rely on him alone are now children of the Most High God. And one day, because of this, because of Christ, we will all be in the presence of the Holy God for eternity. So thanks be to Jesus forever and ever. Amen. To finish this teaching, I just want to have this quote by C.S. Lewis, girls. How little people know who think that the holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. When people see God's holiness as something dull and boring, it is because they don't know the true holiness. But so once someone meets the real thing, it becomes irresistible to them. Their life is changed. I pray that uh, I pray that whatever I said, I hope, and I pray that you could understand that God is holy and He's not like us. He's not like us in any way. There is nothing like our God. He is on a different level from us. He is perfect. He is perfect and different, and He's far above us. He is transcendent. But He made a way, girls, because He's so just. He can't look at the wrath and the things that we do. He can't look at us. But He made a way. His Holy Son to come on this earth and to die for us. Not just die, but he set his anger that was supposed to be on us, on him. So we could come to this Holy God. And in Hebrews 10.10 10 says that he didn't just die for us, but he also sanctified us on that cross. That now we can live a holy life through him and through his righteousness. We can share. We can be free from the power of sin. And as the Holy Spirit helps us, girls, we can live a life growing. We'll never be perfect, but we can live a life of humbleness to learn this holy God and to strive, to strive to be as if he was. But in one day, when he comes to take us, we will be with him forever in his presence, in his holy presence, enjoying him forever. And I just want to pray. Father God, Devil Jesus, Devil, we thank you for your holy word, Father God. We thank you for who you are, Father God. Who are we, Devil, to speak of you, Devil? We thank you, Devil, because we know, Devil, that you want to show yourself to your children, Devil, that you leave your word here, Devil, that we will know you, Father God. Such as, Devil, to know you is eternal life, and we thank you for who you are, Devil. Please, Devil, Devil, open our eyes, Devil, open our ears, Devil. And draw us to you, Deva, that our minds may be focused to you, Deva. We set our eyes and our thoughts captive to your word and captive to your, who you are, your attributes, Deva, the way you do things, Father God, even though we'll never fully understand, Father God. Help us, Deva. Help us to crucify our flesh, Father God, and to live, Deva, to be, to be directed by your spirit, Father, for the glory of your name. We're here to glorify the holy, true God, Father God. We thank you for this line, Father God. We thank you for all the girls. I pray that the girls can understand and search these scriptures for themselves, Father God, and keep them in our hearts as a treasure, Father. And we give you all the praise, Devil. We thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen.